don't mess with Michael. When did I don't remember saying that. When did I say that? Two and a half. Good grief. Who remembers what I said two and a half months ago? Okay. So they get me a t-shirt for my birthday. Don't mess with Michael, Daniel 10, 13. So I said, I'm going to wear it for Sunday school. He said, you got it to do. And I said, well, I'm going to do it. So I appreciate Chris and Helen. That's pretty good. <laughs> Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians 5. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, let's start there while you turn into 2 Corinthians. Back up a little bit. Uh, we were talking about the love of God. Let me read 1 Corinthians 13 to you while you're getting there. And we were examining um, what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues... They shall cease, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So I explained last Sunday a principle. Of, you see it all through the Bible. You just got to know where to look. But you see it all through the Bible of birth, death, resurrection, or birth, death, new birth. Um, think of Joseph. Joseph the son of uh, um, Jacob, that when Joseph was his favorite son, his father clothed him with that coat of many colors. That's a picture of Christ glorified with the rainbow. Um, the rainbow is in the cloud. Christ is in the cloud. So Joseph is a typology of Jesus coming. So Joseph then is taken by his brothers. He's they throw him in a pit, they pretend to kill him, they bring the coat back, they strip him of his garments like they did Jesus, they bring the coat back to uh, um, Jacob, and they say, a beast, a beast has slain him, a beast has killed him. Do you get that language, the beast? The beast has killed him. So Jacob thinks that his son has died. So his son was born. Jacob thinks that his son Joseph, his beloved son, is dead. And you do the math. The Bible gives you all the numbers on, on the life of Joseph. When Joseph was taken and sold, he was 17. When Joseph then reveals himself to his brothers, he's 39. Do the math. How many years transpired? 39 minus 17. Huh? 22. Very good. So give him extra credit on his math pace. 22 is the number for revelation. And it was exactly 22 years later that Joseph says, It is I, Joseph, your brother, be not afraid. He then is revealed. And what that's a picture of, it's a picture of Christ's second coming when he reveals who he is to his brothers, Israel. It's all going to happen exactly the way the Bible lays it out. Uh, 39, that's 39 books in the Old Testament. Christ, when he comes, he's in the form of the law, the Old Testament, the old body. But then that is done away, and then now there's a new covenant. So all of that's a picture, the birth, the death, and then the rebirth. So Joseph then is, is sort of rebirthed. Jacob lives for 22 years thinking his son, his beloved favorite son is dead. Then when the, can you imagine being the brothers? of Joseph, riding back to their father to get him. He said, Dad, um, you remember that day? There's the rain. Said, Dad, you remember that day when uh, we came in and told you that Joseph was killed? Well, Dad, I don't know how to tell you this, but he's alive. <laughs> we lied to you. And... Jacob's probably going, what? Jacob is revived at that time. I mean, he's an old man and he's pining away, staring at that bloody garment for 22 years. Then all of a sudden, he finds out that his beloved son is alive. Not only is he alive, 
but he's like the king of the whole Gentile world. And he's the one that has all the food for Israel to live. There's so many things, so many typologies in that. Naomi. Naomi is married to her husband. And she then has, that whole family has a, has a large inheritance. But there's a famine. And her husband dies. And then her two sons who are married to these Moabite women, they die. So Naomi then has all this land that has nobody to inherit it. There is no namesake to be passed down because the husband's died and the two son-in-law or two sons have died and all she has is daughter-in-laws. One of them goes back to Moab and to her gods. But it's Ruth who says, I will be, you know, I will, whithersoever thou goest, I will go and, you know, I'll stay with you no matter what. And so Ruth then goes back with, um, with uh, Naomi, who Ruth is the Gentile bride. She's, she's us sitting here. Naomi is Israel that has, has lost her inheritance. She has lost her favor. She has a reproach upon her because she has no offspring to hand all that land down to. So then Ruth then gets married to Boaz, who is the redeemer. Boaz, by the law, bought and paid for the rights to the inheritance of Naomi's dead husband and by marrying Ruth who was the wife of what he couldn't marry Naomi she's too old to raise up seed so he marries Ruth and then the seed is restored to Naomi's husband's bloodline so now the child and you see that in the book of Ruth the child is born and that child then is given over to Naomi and says, this is your son right here. Can you imagine that? Your first child ever. But because you love your mother-in-law so much, you take that child and give him to her and say, he is your son now. You raise him. And what that is, is a pic. there's the life of the inheritance through Naomi's husband. But he dies and that life is dead. But now there's new life. There's a resurrection. There's a new start. And it's better than it would have been beforehand. And that's what, that's what we're getting into in Scripture. This idea of a new heaven and a new earth and a new birth in Jesus Christ. When you are saved, all the old stuff is gone away. It's done away with. It's over with. Sins are forgiven, mistakes that are made that you regret, those are all passed away. Everything then becomes brand new. So 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man, is there any stipulation about who's not qualified for this? No, it says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are, how many things have become new? It says all of them. So if people want a brand new start, Jesus is the one who gives that. Old things are passed away. All things become new. Notice that he says, in Christ. That phrase, in Christ. Take a, does anybody happen to know how many times that phrase is found in the King James Bible? There's a number. I'll give you a free DVD if you know it. 77 times, exactly. Write that down. And then write down the word church. 77 times, exactly, King James Bible. 77 times. The lineage of Jesus in Luke chapter 3, from Jesus going backward down to Adam, to God, 77 names in that lineage. So what that means is the church is, we are the inheritors. Um, we, are, we are going to reign and rule with Christ. And Jesus, whatever he inherits, he's going to give to us. We are, what is the verse I'm looking for? Um, I can't think of the verse, but anyway, we are, we are joint heirs with Jesus. That's what I was thinking of. Joint heirs. So whatever Christ receives in his inheritance, he is giving it also to the church. Uh, think of Noah. You go back to, um, go to Genesis 8. Genesis 8. I can teach... Two, three hours on this one subject of a new life and a new beginning. Genesis 8. How many people were on the ark? Eight. Eight is new life, new beginnings, a new start. Day seven is the Sabbath. 
That's the end of the week. The next day, which is today, starts a new week. It's, a, it's like being resurrected over again. Whatever happened last week, whatever happened last week is gone. Amen? Whether it was good, even if it was great, it's gone. You cannot live on old blessings. It's like, it's like when the Rams won the Super Bowl. I mean, we was hooting and hollering and doing the belly five and so excited and we're going to Disney World the next day and all that stuff, right? Rams, Rams win the Super Bowl. The next day, I wake up and it's like my life is exactly the same as it was the day, than, it, than the day before. There was no significant change in my life whatsoever. I didn't win that game. And even Kurt Warner... Once he won the game, got all the money, got the trophy, got the trip to Disney World, got the endorsements, got the new, everything like that. That Super Bowl's gone. Now you got to win another one to keep that going. That's what athletes run into who get all these medals and prizes and trophies and awards and everything like that. When their career is done, what do you do? What do you have? So even the blessings that you got last week, they're gone. And if you try to live on old blessings, they're not there. So this is a new week and whatever was bad is gone. Whatever was good is gone. And now God's going to start something all over again. If any, uh, anyway, Genesis 8 is what I was showing you. You have verse uh, 1. God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. Christ was the ark. That's what being in Christ means. Noah was not hanging on the outside of the ark, enduring. He was in the ark. He was in a safe place, being held there, being kept there. Um, look at verse, oh, let's see here. Verse 15, God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth to the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Verse, that's verse 16, that's 8 times 2. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both the fowl and the cattle and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. So Genesis 8, 8 people walk off the ark. They're in Christ, they're in the ark. And now they're walking out into a brand new world. Everything is going to have to be regenerated. All the life that was on the ark, all the seeds that were in the ground, all the trees that had been killed in the flood, now they're going to have to start all over again. Everything, literally everything in the world was brand new. So, and I'll throw this again at you. If the Bible's not right concerning the flood story, we don't... We don't have any hope. We can't have any promises if God lied to us about the ark, the flood, how, many, how much it covered. If God lied to us here, why wouldn't God lie to us here? So the ark, the flood, the animals has to be true. Has to be. Because God used that to show us the new heaven and the new earth. So if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Um, Whatever is in your life that was in the past, leave it there. You might have some counselor or somebody telling you, well, let's go dig up now what's in your past so that can, that can heal you. Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind. Let it go. Don't dig up, don't go dig up old bones. Don't pull out old skeletons. Leave them. Start a new life. Start all over again. Hebrews 8. He's talking about the old and the new covenant. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. I'm going to preach that this morning with the house of Judah. So in verse 13, in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. How many of us know that one? If it's waxing old, it's ready to vanish. Okay? But, it's, but that's necessary. It's part of life. Somebody dies that we love. 
If we know they're going to heaven, then let them go to heaven. Let them go. Why would we want them to hang around here and suffer? Let them go. Um, so that's the new heaven and new earth ideology that's all through the scriptures. So Revelation 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. I touched on that last week. Sea represents fire, burning, salt. It's done away with. No more, no more punishment, no more judgment. Except to those who are in the lake of fire. Second, Second Corinthians chapter 3. We, each one of us, are priests. Unto God. Just like the Levites. Were the able ministers of God. God segregated them. God separated them out. God would not give them a land inheritance. He gave them a ministry inheritance. So whatever. Whatever course God has you on. Stay that course. Whatever gift God has given you. Continue in that gift. Whatever blessing you are blessed with, continue in that blessing. That is, that is what God has called you to do. He has made us able ministers of the New Testament. Not the letter, but of the Spirit. The Hebrew Roots followers hate verses like this. They hate them. They hate Paul. I had a lady write me an email and she said, I think, I've got, I think I've got a new revelation here, Pastor Mike, and I'm just going to share it with you. I think Paul was a false apostle. And I'm going, well, that eliminates 14 books out of the New Testament. I mean, you're getting rid of almost half of the New Testament, and you're eliminating most of the vital doctrines of salvation. So I wrote her back, and I said, well, let me tell you what the Bible says. Peter in second peter told everybody to go read paul peter acknowledged him paul showed up in acts chapter 15 at the count the jerusalem council they didn't kick him out then they said let's listen to paul see what he's got to say peter tells us in second peter to go read paul and he says i know it's a little hard to understand but let god you know teach you what it means so peter accepted paul but what and i knew where that was coming from she was she was watching youtube and getting her doctrine from idiots. That's what she was doing. She was getting her doctrine from people who don't, who say, they believe, oh, we're the ones who believe the Bible. They don't believe the Bible. They don't, because they don't like what this says. So what they do with the phrase New Testament, they don't like that because of what it says. So they call it something close to it, renewed covenant, which means that we're to go back and keep the Mount Sinai salvation covenant. Which means we must perfectly perform every law that God laid down for our salvation. And if we break it one time, we're condemned. Because that's what God said. He said, I want you to keep all of my statutes and my judgments. In my covenant. All of it. Now, you don't get a pick. I don't, I'm not satisfied with most of it. I want all of it. So the Hebrew Roots people, they don't, they don't like, they, they don't call it the Old Testament. They never use that phrase. They call it Torah. And then they tell you, Torah means God's instructions for life. Like, this is how God really wants you to live. And if you're really not living that way, then you're not honoring God. You're not pleasing God. It's a lie. It's an absolute lie because they believe that they're the ones who are keeping all of these laws, but they're not even close to keeping the law. They're lying to themselves and they're lying to everybody else. So able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit for the letter killeth the spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, the old covenant written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? So the old ministration, new ministration. The old ministration was glorious, but the new ministers 
are more glorious than the old ones. Hebrews 7. If therefore, look at your Bible, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood. And this is, I'm going to help somebody. Somebody asked a question. Uh, Lisa was going through Facebook. And somebody had asked a question and they wanted me to take notice of it. They were asking about a particular pastor down in Florida. And I, they said, you know, we're, we're looking at this church, maybe thinking about going to it, and they follow this certain guy. I won't give you the name. He's now gone on. He's died. I'll leave it late. But they said, you know, can we go, what do you know about this guy? And I said, well, he, he is a hyper-dispensationalist. He believes in multiple gospels. He believes that they're, the old covenant was a gospel to the Jews that if that that's how they were saved they were saved by law keeping but that's not true because even though they went through the motions in the ceremonies killing the calves doing all of this they didn't follow perfectly the law and God says all through the New Testament that the blood of bulls and calves cannot atone for sins it was never intended God never intended killing a bull or sacrificing a goat to be a satisfactory atonement for, for our sins. It was never meant to be that way. And he says, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Who is Melchizedek? Turn to uh, Genesis chapter 14. Genesis 14. Some say Melchizedek was Christ himself. Some say my, my particular idea was that Melchizedek was an angel. There is no disagreement about what the order of Melchizedek is. The order of Melchizedek is an angelic priesthood tribe. It is a company of angels who minister in heaven there is a temple in heaven God sits in that temple there are cherubs that their wings cover the glory of God there are there are angels who give attendance to an altar in heaven well I'd like to see that and they are the ones who Keep the fire of the altar going. They're the ones who offer up the incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So there is an order of angels in heaven. And that's what the Levitical priesthood was modeled after. In other words, what's on earth was a shadow of what really is in heaven. And that order of angels is called the order of Melchizedek. Now, the Levitical priesthood was called the order of Aaron. Aaron was a Levite, the brother of Moses, and Aaron was the first high priest, and then his sons followed after him, and his sons followed after him, and so on and so on. But they were all Levite priests, and he's, that's what he's saying here. If, well, let's, let's read about Melchizedek. Genesis 14, look in verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, that's not Salem cigarettes. That, come, that makes me mad every time I see it. Merck used to smoke Salem's. I remember that. An old friend of my mom and dad's. King of Salem. Salem is Shalom. It's the Hebrew word Shalom. means peace. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be. See, this is a... I mean, this is not a son of Levi blessing Abraham. This is someone higher than Abraham blessing him. The greater blesses the lesser. The lesser cannot bless the greater. Okay? So he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And let me skip on down. But anyway, Abram paid tithes of everything that he had to Melchizedek. So again, there's some who say Melchizedek was Christ in angelic form before he comes and is born in Bethlehem. My 
opinion is that Melchizedek was a high priest of an angelic order that Jesus was a part of that order of priest of heaven. Could be wrong. There's little disagreement, but it's not a big deal as far as I'm concerned. Um, but anyway, that's what that's talking about. So he said, if the Levitical priesthood could accomplish the job of atonement by sacrificing calves and bulls, then why do we need Melchizedek? Why does there have to be an order of angels who are priests who give attendance to the altar of God? Why, why, does, there have, why does there have to be an order of Melchizedek? If, we, if the tribe of Levi accomplished the task, why was Jesus? And Jesus was not, he's a high priest, but he wasn't from the tribe of Judah. Or excuse me, he wasn't from the tribe of Levi. He's from the tribe of Judah. The fourth son, not the third son. There's a difference. So that's what he's getting at here. Why do we need Christ being from the order of Melchizedek if Levi accomplished the task of atonement for sins? So in verse 19, for the law made nothing perfect. The law does not make anybody perfect. Speed limit signs do not stop people from breaking the speed limit. Right? Cops do. <laughs> okay? Radars do. But speed limit signs don't. People speed past speed limit signs. They pay no attention to it. People break the law. The law made nothing perfect. law didn't make you and I perfect. But the bringing in of a better hope did. By the which we draw nigh unto God. Hebrews 9, let me give you this. Hebrews 9, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. The law does not, and it did not save anybody, period. Because they didn't, and it wasn't the law's fault. It was our fault. Because we didn't follow the law. It's that. And so then, God establishes this by making the Ark of the Covenant disappear. The Ark of the Covenant is essential for keeping the law. Because on the Day of Atonement, the blood is sprinkled seven times on a certain side of the Ark of the Covenant. And then God has mercy for one year. One year only. So in the days of Josiah, we know the Ark was there. But after the days of Josiah, the Ark of the Covenant goes missing. And so when they have the temple there in Jerusalem... The, the veil is rent when Christ dies. They see no ark. There can be no atonement without that ark. There can, they can't keep the law. God made it impossible for the Jews to keep the law. Period. Impossible. So, verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of... This is the time of reformation right here. Reformation or reformation. When Christ died rose again, now we're, ha now we're reforming everything. And we're not following the old covenant which said do and live. The new covenant says believe and live. Who's a sinner? Who's a sinner? You're the sinner. You cannot keep God's law. But you can believe what God said. That's the, that's the difference. That's the new covenant that gives us the new birth, that gives us the new heaven. By a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So that's why all the temples were destroyed. And there, if, if the Jews right now wanted to start sacrifices again, they still couldn't keep the law because there's no temple. No temple. It's gone. And some say, well, they're going to rebuild it. I'm not so sure about that. That's just, that's no big deal. But Christ is the one who builds the temple not made with hands. That's where our atonement is. And that one's in the new Jerusalem. Not the old Jerusalem. All right. Hebrews 10, you study that on your own. Um, 
He says, verse 9, then said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. There it is right there. So when God took away the prophecies and the tongue speaking and the private interpretations in the early churches, God did away with that because what was second was established. And what was second was the written word of God translated in languages for people to understand. Okay, so if anybody says, oh, we speak in tongues and we prophesy in our church, you can say, so do we. We just use King James to do it. Okay, because that's what we're doing. Anyway. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your blessing. Thank you for a new covenant and a new start. Father, there's some people that are needing a fresh start, a new life. I pray that you'd give it to them. Father, people in our group, people all over the world that are tired of living the wicked life that they lived and they want something better or people that have been lured into cults lured into pretended law keeping lured into legalism now they're in bondage to some religious figure now they're in bondage to somebody and they're not free and they're tired of being in bondage they want to be made free I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give new life, new purpose, new blessings. And thank you, God, for a new Jerusalem, a new heaven, a new earth, a new birth, new covenant. Thank you that you make all things new. Blessing on your word today and bless these people. I love you. And I love them. I pray, God, that you'd go with them and bless them. Be with our church service this morning. Bless the preaching of your word. Hear us when we sing, Father. We love you in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.